thanks to the Student Brass Ensemble for leading us in worship today, and a special welcome to all of you who are here to celebrate with Professor Gary his award as number one professor in the state of Minnesota. What a delight to gather together. Woo. Gary was invited to preach in chapel long before anyone knew anything about this award, but it seems as if God must have known something was up. The Lord be with you. Our prayer this morning comes from the World Day of Prayer for Students as we celebrate International Week on campus. From deep down, O Lord, we call to you. From deep down in our lives, where our thoughts become contradictory, and we are naked, stripped from the masks of hypocrisy. It is there that we praise you. We praise you from student desks, in the classroom, in daily life, in art, in sports and recreation. We praise you as student workers in the midst of our efforts and sacrifices to work and study at the same time. We praise you as faculty and staff and administrators. From deep down, in our hearts we cry out, may everything that breathes praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. from Jeremiah 23, 5. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will rise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall reign as king and deal wisely, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. A reading from Colossians 1. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. Please stand for the gospel reading. Gospel from Luke 23, 33 to 38. When they came to the place that is called the skull, 
They crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was an al also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. The word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a good morning. It is a good day. It is a red letter day in the history of Augsburg College. Ordinarily, it would be utterly unnecessary for me to introduce Gary Hesser in this space and to this congregation of worshipers. Since this chapel opened its doors, I would venture to say that Gary Hesser has more than any other person with the exception, the notable exception of Pastor Dave, maybe Pastor Sonia, and former President Charles Anderson, Gary has approached this lectern more often than any other person on this campus and been received more warmly and done it with more humility. So this is not an ordinary day. And to prove it, I have a decree, which I will read. <clears throat> This is a proclamation from the governor of Minnesota. There are six warrants, I will spare you, and read only three of them. <laughs> Whereas the US Professors of the Year program, sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, that's CASE, is the only national program for excellent undergraduate teaching, and whereas the Minnesota Professor of the Year represents thousands of dedicated university and college instructors throughout the state of Minnesota who serve their students, community, and state with dedication and talent. And <clears throat> whereas Dr. Gary Hesser, Professor of Sociology at Augsburg College, has been named 2004 Minnesota Professor of the Year by Case and the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, now therefore I, Tim Polenti, Governor of Minnesota, proclaimed November 18th, 2004 to be Dr. Gary Hesser Day in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> Welcome, Gary. Frankie and I did not grow up Lutherans or in this part of the world, and to know that there is a real non sequitur to read the gospel and then have a person lifted up and then move to a homily, but we'll walk all around heresies of that regard. I'm, I'm humbled, and as I will try to say at noon, and I've said to many of you, uh, this has been an extraordinary place to be for these 28, almost 28 years, and uh, the gift of community is about the greatest gift anyone can be born into and share in one's life. As we begin wrestling season here at Augsburg, I want to reflect on another wrestling match that's going on. This match is at the center of much of our post-election analysis, and it has to do with moral values. And I think it's closely related to the popular question, what would Jesus do? I certainly don't plan to resolve all that question today, and you probably are grateful to know that. But I do want to advance the proposition that anyone who wants to use or claim the name of Jesus or to know what Jesus would do must also grapple with and embrace that other J word, justice. This Sunday, we're celebrating Christ the King Sunday. The text from Jeremiah, Paul, and Luke were just read. Each text turns the idea of kingship absolutely upside down. 
and it follows a pattern that Jesus himself did with amazing consistency and frequency. Paul and many Christians, including myself, advance the claim that Jesus represents for us the, invisible, the image of the invisible God, and then in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. But no image or understanding of the fullness of God is complete, according to biblical witnesses, unless it incorporates justice. I think the best answer regarding core moral values is indeed closely related to the question, what would Jesus do? And the Gospels, Luke, that we've been reading all this season, offers us a very good window into just what Jesus would say and do. Twice, Luke tells of two very imposing gentlemen who come to Jesus and ask him point blank the question that takes center stage for most religious seekers. First, there was the lawyer bent on tricking him in chapter 10, and then the rich ruler in chapter 18 who seems more genuine. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I find it very interesting that in both instances, Jesus' answers had little or nothing to do with what they had to believe in order to deal with the question of eternal life, but instead with what they needed to do relative to other people in the communities in which they lived. To the lawyer, Jesus' answer was a story that cut to the heart of injustice and racism, an answer that boldly and quite intentionally, I think, defined neighborliness to the lawyer and to the early Christians and to us in a radically new and inclusive way. Jesus dramatically depicted the racially discriminated against Samaritan as the one who understood neighborliness and that neighborliness is not just being civil and nice to each other, but it involves intentionally tearing down the walls of separation and hostility and building new inclusive communities. I would go so far as to say that in this teaching and in his life, Jesus was and is the image of the invisible God, who shows us quite clearly in this parable and his life that the one in whom the fullness of God chose to dwell saw as his vocation to call into question the unjust social and cultural structures and assumptions of his time. Eight chapters later, when the rich ruler asked the very same question about eternal life, Jesus, as he often did, answered the question with another question. And when the ruler answered in the affirmative, Jesus replied, there is one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor. Then come follow me. In these familiar stories, Jesus is crystal clear that his kingdom involves a fundamental rethinking, a rethinking about wealth and race and ethnicity and gender and equality for every one of God's children. The rich man and Lazarus and other similar parables in Luke follow Jesus' own choice of a text at the beginning of his ministry that underscores his vocation as involving bringing good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and the jubilee which involves fundamental redistribution of wealth. So I have to ask you and myself, why is it so easy to use the Jesus word and yet ignore or keep the justice word at arm's length when we talk about moral values in the church or in election years? In the face of the glaring and the growing gap between the rich and the poor, both in our nation and community and the world, it seems pretty clear to me what Jesus would do and what he would ask us to do if he returned and saw my and others' consumption habits and our unwillingness to really struggle with the injustices and things that plague so many of God's children in this world who are deprived of simply the basics. Jesus had hard questions for the lawyer and the rich ruler, and I think that he would have questions for us 
whenever we want to talk about moral values without talking about justice. In fact, I would go so far as to say that everything I read in the Bible about Jesus convinces me that one of the things that is fundamental to his being, that the one who was in the fullness of God, where the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, that Jesus looked at every human being that he encountered as one who also had the fullness of God embedded deeply and permanently in them. Surely that is what Luther meant when he urged us to be a little Christ to everyone and to see Christ in ourselves as well. And why Melanchthon seemed easily to use the word justice in his description of what a Christian vocation should be. So what holds me, maybe you, back from embracing both J words and seeing them as mutually and inseparable entwined I can't answer for you but I'm afraid that I'm much more like the lawyer and the rich ruler the expectation and the cost are simply too great and I keep hoping that there's an easier way a cheaper grace as Bonhoeffer put it I can't speak for you but I am afraid that I want a lifestyle that's just not too costly certainly not one that interferes with my own privileges and comforts. I really don't want to be reminded every day that the work of justice and peace are precisely what Jesus and God's kingdom are about. But maybe, maybe just maybe, that is why Jesus calls us into relationships, into that very human and fallible thing called the church so that we can hold each other accountable, that we can struggle together to do and be what Jesus would have us do and be, and together hear the word of forgiveness and grace as we gather together to be strengthened and emboldened to accept our vocation, that vocation of a never-ending call to keep working with others to move us closer to God's kingdom where there is justice for all. Amen. We'll do stanza five of the last, of the next uh, hymn. Due to the International Education Week, I've been asked to pray in my first language, which is Spanish. So if you ever took Spanish in high school, now's the time to practice. Um, Gracias, Señor, te damos por este día. Gracias por la bendición de estar aquí vivos y aprender de tu palabra. Te pedimos que bendigas el resto de nuestras actividades, que bendigas la universidad, Señor, y todos sus profesores, especialmente el profesor Gary Hesser. Te pedimos también, Señor, que nos acompañes y te agradecemos por el regalo de Jesús. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Oh, God of wisdom, on this day we are aware of the magnificent array of gifts that you have given to your people, your children. And we, we thank you and celebrate especially the gifts 
given to your child, Gary Hesser, this day. You amaze us by the ways you use your children to discover your call and pursue their vocation to make this world a more just, a more healthy, a more decent and holy place. You continue to provide faithful workers for your church and your institutions for Augsburg. By your Holy Spirit, give your servants insight into your word, holy lives as example to us all, and courage to know and do the truth. This day, we celebrate the mix of play, work, and study that has been given us and still gives rhythm, care, and balance to our lives at Augsburg. And this morning, we turn to you and are bold to ask for healing in our mix of play, work, and study, that we would find rhythm and balance in Jesus Christ. As we think about the body of Christ and know we are part of one of each other, we remember those members who might suffer this day and need strength from the other parts of the body. Chuck and Diane and Christy and Emily and Eunice, Debbie, Nick. We remember Tom and Emily and Aaron as they grieve and others that we lift to you now silently in our hearts. Allow us also to heed the words of Gary and to examine ourselves individually and ourselves corporately as your body, that we would see the world as your body and that we might discover the suffering of this world this day. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Let us stand and sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, 551 in the Green Book. We'll do all three. invited back tomorrow at 1020 to hear this wonderful family sound. Receive the benediction. Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is within us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. Let us now go out and change our world as God has changed our lives in Christ.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. If I could interrupt your uh, your your munching for a few minutes, um, we'll do a just a brief start to this before we finish eating. Um, my name is Dan Jorgensen, Director of Public Relations. I want to welcome you all on behalf of President Frame, and uh, his wife Anne is right here in front. And so just to recognize that she's here today, and you'll hear from other uh, dignitaries in our audience as we get further into the program, um, including from Mr. Hesser himself, or Dr. Hesser, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, before we get started, I just wanted to read a letter that came today from Robin Hesser. It says, to the great Professor Hesser, otherwise known to me as the greatest dad on earth. Dad, unfortunately, I'm unable to attend the festivities today. She's uh, overseas right now. But you can imagine me sitting in the front row beaming with pride as if I were to be there. Being the great father, supporting, and encouraging person that you are, I have heard more times than I could ever begin to count how proud you are of me. Your students and colleagues have heard stories about me and have seen you shine with pride of your family and children. 
Today it is my turn to tell you how proud you make me and to share with your students and colleagues my pride in having you as a father. I will begin by saying that you never cease to amaze me. I have watched you work. I have witnessed your dedication to your family, your students, your colleagues, the college, your community, and all the organizations you involve yourself in. I have seen and heard of many of your accomplishments and acknowledgments that have come from this dedication. However, just when I think I've heard about all of them, I learn about more. I often find myself sitting back saying, wow, he did that too? <laughs> and he was, an, he was an involved father at the same time. If you will allow me for a moment to brag about my father, those of us who know him may know that his own humbleness and modesty in his accomplishments often keeps him from doing that himself. It is due to this humbleness that I often do not hear about all of his accomplishments. However, it is due to his many accomplishments and the work he has done with various people and groups locally, nationally, and even internationally that has allowed me to hear about many of his great doings. I cannot begin to count the number of people I have run into, not only on campus, but around the Twin Cities, and I can go even as far to say as yes, I have met people internationally who are eager to share stories with me about how great my father is. <laughs> I must say that my heart just swells with pride when I introduce myself to someone and have them respond with, Hesser, as in Gary Hesser? <laughs> Do you know how great he is? <laughs> and then have them follow with a story on the impact he had on their life. Not only is he a dedicated father who stays up to date on what all of his five children, wife, and grandchildren are doing, not only does he make it a priority to attend sporting events, plays, art exhibits, in and out of state that his family is involved in, but he also makes it a priority to stay up to date and attend the extracurricular activities of his students, as well as those of his colleagues' children. Not only does he leave his door open for students and children to drop in with questions or in search of advice, but he also takes the time to answer phone calls from students when questions arise after office hours. Not only is he involved in his own community, but he attends events and takes the time to work with other communities nationwide. And not only is he a dedicated, not only is he dedicated in his work with Augsburg, but he finds the time to dedicate himself to other organizations as well. It is of no wonder, Dad, that you have made such a lasting impact on so many, including me. And it should never go untold how proud I am to be able to call you Dad. Thus, I too would like to join your fan club of students and colleagues present today in recognizing you for just how wonderful you are, in saying thank you for the impact you have had on my life, and in saying thank you for teaching me, advising me, and on occasion lecturing me. <laughs> I could not have asked for a better person, teacher, role model, or superhero to be my father. With that, can we make a little noise and give it up for my pops, the great Professor Hesser? <laughs> And now I'd like to ask Pastor Sonia Hagender to come up and lead us in prayer. And then enjoy your dinner and or lunch and we'll get back to a little program shortly. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, your spirit formed and created the world and all living things. We give you thanks for stirring up your spirit in Gary Husser for his talents, extraordinary commitment, passion, and brilliance. We give you thanks for all of his mentors and colleagues, family and friends that teach and learn and live together. We give you thanks for Augsburg College that over and over brings all kinds of people to the table. Continue to raise up passionate and spirit-filled leaders who know your word, who carry your heart, who witness to your love, and who will empower your people for the sake of this world you love so very much. We are so bold as to pray, welcome us at your table, God. Bless this food to our bodies and minds. Bless our table conversation with joy and laughter. And stir us up by your spirit with delight and respect for our whole community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon. I'm Frankie Shackelford. This is a very exciting day in my life, as well as in Gary Hesser's life and Augsburg's life. I mean, it's not every day you get to first stand in for the governor and then stand in for the president of the college and the provost, but that's my role now. <laughs> um, so on their behalf, let me please welcome you to this luncheon in honor of Gary Hesser. Gary, congratulations. We are going to start a series of tributes here. I am not going to give you a tribute. I'm going to provide the context for other people's tributes. Uh, and some of that has to do with my job here on campus. You know, I have the best administrative job at Augsburg College. The buck never stops in my office. <laughs> the buck hardly ever comes in my office. But in, in, I have a budget of $975 as Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning Enhancement. And all the big issues I can push off to either Chris Kimball or to Bill Frame. And what I get to deal with is creating optimal learning environments. My title is Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning Enhancement. And on a daily basis, it's not this exciting, but it's, it's very important and good work. And I have a lot of help. I have directors in seven different programs who are working with things that are sometimes tightly focused as, for example, the undergraduate research program and graduate opportunities. Or sometimes they are focusing on a special population, like the, under, the underrepresented populations who are first generation or low income students, the, the TRIO SSS program. Uh, I also work with the class office, who supports students with learning disabilities. And I work with the Center for Teaching and Learning and the Lilly Grant, um, our grant for exploring our gifts on, voc on vocation. These are huge mandates. And I think Gary Hesser has worked with every group that I have mentioned here, notably in the area of experiential learning. From the first minute I stepped foot on this campus, in fact, before I was actually teaching my first class, I went to a faculty retreat in August of 1990 where I met Gary Hesser and began to learn things about Kolb and the experiential model and reflective practice. And I saw Gary right away as a leader, and he became my mentor. Now that's a hard admission coming from a Texan about an oaky. <laughs> However, <laughs> Gary has been very, very useful uh, in professional development and, and helping us design workshops on experiential learning, on service learning. On retreats, he was uh, very central in the planning of the one we had in Stillwater to focus on the lift bridge. So he's come to, to be, for me, a right-hand man in, in every sense of the word. His teaching and his mentoring are also legendary, which is why when CTL, the Center for Teaching and Learning, instituted the very first awards, the Distinguished Awards uh, in Teaching and Learning last spring, Gary got the one that was dedicated to excellence in mentoring. So when Chris Kimball came to me and said, should we try and nominate somebody for the Professor of the Year Award? I said, yes. Let's nominate Gary. And thanks to the folks that you're going to be hearing from now, um, he got a lot of support for that nomination. Now, I want to give you just 30 seconds of background on what the award is and the process, because the Carnegie Foundation, as you may know, was, was started in 1905, and it has always been there to support excellence in undergraduate teaching. This is the only national award for teaching at the undergraduate level. They took nominations, some 500 nominations from all over the country, and they chose four who were national winners. There were two English professors, one economics professor, one physics professor from Colorado who got actually the Nobel Prize in physics, and then one state winner from each of the 50 states. When you look at that list, a lot of the state winners come from huge universities, the University of Michigan. Ann Arbor, from the University of Wisconsin, University of Nebraska. They also come from top-ranked schools in the nation, from Reed College, from Purdue, from Rutgers. We are in such elite company here, and it makes me so happy to be able to introduce to you the people who will now speak on uh, Gary's behalf. The first one will be Tracy Beckman, who is our um, liaison for government affairs here at Augsburg College. Tracy. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, I've been at Augsburg for a year, and uh, it's like your daughter, Gary. I, 
as I look around and see what's going on at Augsburg, it's like, wow, they're doing that there too. And I set out on this uh, sort of journey to look at all of the unique things that were going on at Augsburg, primarily focusing on programs. And uh, I was talking to John Evans one day, who's an uh, alumni here and who, who uh, I talked back and forth with, with on a lot of government community relations issues, and he kept saying, but have you met Gary Hesser yet? And I'd say, well, I haven't yet, but I'll, I'll get a chance to do that soon. And then the next time I'd talk to him, I hadn't quite got around to, have you met Gary Hesser yet? And uh, finally, finally I did. And uh, I understand why John and why others uh, are uh, so complimentary of this guy. He's just, uh, I think the best way I could describe him, he's just a neat guy. And uh, it gives me pleasure to read uh, this letter from uh, one of our distinguished alumni, Martin, Congressman Martin Sable. I write with great pride and enthusiasm to say congratulations on being chosen as Minnesota's Professor of the Year. You are well deserving of this prestigious national recognition for your many years of innovative and creative teaching at Augsburg. Gary, your courses in sociology and urban studies have brought your students into communities from the Twin Cities to Washington, D.C. This integration has created a whole new level of not only teaching and learning, but service as well. Again, congratulations, Gary. You have brought great honor, not only to yourself, but to Augsburg College, our community, and our great state of Minnesota. Keep up the good work. Martin Olaf Sable, Member of Congress. Thank you. I also received a call this morning from Paul Zerby's office, and I think he's your neighbor over there, Gary, and he sends best regards too as well. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Kaiser, and I'm the executive director of the Higher Education Consortium for Urban Affairs. And I'm just enormously pleased and honored to be part of this day celebrating Gary. Just about a year ago, we gathered right here at uh, Augsburg College to also honor Gary for his 25 years of service with HECUA. So it's lovely to, to be returning for this double honor to have him named, uh, to have this day named Gary Hesser Day by the governor. <laughs> as well as to receive, to know that he's receiving this wonderful honor from Carnegie and Case. Um, it's really impossible to think about Hecua or talk about Hecua without talking about and thinking about Gary. He's been a member of Hecua pretty much as long as there's been a Hecua. Uh, he wasn't there for its infancy, which Joel Torskinson was, and it's wonderful to see Joel here today. But Gary was there for the teenage years and the difficult late adolescence, <laughs> for ang the anxiety and angst of that period. And he's um, certainly brought us all the way through to this early middle age of an organization being 33 years old um, and feeling like it's really at the peak of its prime. Uh, Gary's held every office and done every task within HECUA. He's even been stepped in to be interim director at a time when of great challenge and transition, and that's a little bit daunting for me as the current director. This is my only job, and I get paid for it, and Gary did it when he was holding down his full teaching job as a wonderful volunteer, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's hard to fill his shoes. Um, through all these years with HECUA and with the work that Gary's been doing here in, at Augsburg, He's, keeps, he's been opening his house. He's always opened his house up to uh, consortium dinners and potlucks. He's uh, visiting programs around the U.S. and uh, in uh, other places around the world to see how things are doing up close. He's been pedaling his bicycle to and from our HECU events. Um, he's advised countless students in helping them leap into experiential learning and nudging them in the direction of off-campus studies. He's really helped the, con the consortium continuously assess the effect of their our, our programs on students themselves and the communities in which the students are studying and working and the institutions and faculty that send them off and welcome them back at the end of their studies. And he's always, always sharing what he knows with others through writing and speaking and presentations. But one of the most valued roles that Gary has played within HECUA and in every effort that he's been a part of is keeping us centered and on an even keel. He's been like a rudder for the long voyage, and when we get too expansive or if we sail too far out or forget our, what we're here to do, he calls us back 
to our shared work and our magnetic pole, preparing students to be active, engaged, reflective people and citizens and learners and agents of social justice and social change, and really providing colleges and universities and communities with powerful ways to do that together in true consortium. So the story of Gary's history with Hecua um, almost perfectly parallels his, the story of his career-long commitment to Augsburg College and to his students and his colleagues and to the communities where he's lived and worked and organized and to the national field of experiential learning and higher education of which he is a most valued colleague. Uh, indeed, if I were to, uh, to draw one of um, Gary's famous Venn diagrams, and you all know what I'm talking about, um, there would be a rich and deep um, area in which the circles come together. Um, because whether Gary is at a HECUA meeting or a campus departmental meeting or sitting with you over a cup of coffee or talking with students, um, he brings with him the same passions, the same generous spirit, the same goodwill, the same insightful view, the same steady, steady example of what it means to bring together the personal and the professional and not to be able to tell where one stops and the other begins. One of Gary's really remarkable traits is his ability to draw us all together, as he's done today so capably, and to really bring together different individuals and institutions and ideal, ideas and efforts and to remind us that we're all better together we can accomplish more when we work in community with each other, uh, even in times of uncertainty, perhaps especially in times of uncertainty when we tend to, to retreat back into our own hiding holes. We need to come out and um, form a community together. We can be bolder and more imaginative and more intentional and more effective when we strive to work together. Uh, we're likely to be right more often than wrong. At least we won't fall in the same potholes as we fell in the time before. And we can stand on each other's shoulders. So I wanted to thank Gary for, again, gathering us in at a time, especially now when we are sometimes standing apart or flying away. It's an important role that he plays for us. And while we're here to celebrate Gary's as a, as a pioneer and a lifelong practitioner and leader of experiential learning in all of its many forms, Gary would be the first one to say that the chapters that lie ahead are every bit as enthralling as the ones that have been written. And that's probably one of the reasons he's such a great listener. He certainly taught me an awful lot about deep and active and reflective listening. Um, if you know Gary, you can see he's always leaning in and he's got his ear out to be sure he can catch what it is you're saying because it matters to him. He's interested in not just what you have to say, but the meaning behind the words and the nuances. Um, and Gary's taught us an awful lot about how to listen to each other and how to build open and responsive and attentive organizations. Uh, and for that, I thank him as well. And as, as I, my last thought really is I've been rereading Lee Shore and her book Common Purpose in the wake of the election and finding great comfort there. Lee talks about the importance of working together to make our American form of democracy more just. And she invites us to think about cathedral builders of old who had worked backwards from a grand design and were willing to commit to a cause they would not realize in their own lifetimes, nor work that they could do on their own. The stonemason, she says, who sets the cornerstone of a cathedral knows that he will not see the cupolas added 100 years later, or much less the additions and renovations a 1,000 years beyond that. Uh, Gary knows that very well. Like all cathedral builders and good stonemasons, he helps us keep the long view in mind and is patient and visionary all the while mixing the mortar and handing us the next brick um, to lay in the building so that every day we have a chance to create something grand and lasting together. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Langseth with Minnesota Campus Compact, and like Jenny, I'm honored to be here to say a few words about Gary. 
for those of you that don't know Minnesota Campus Compact, we're a coalition of 48 college and university presidents in the state that are committed to the civic purposes of higher education and a network of thousands of students, faculty, staff, community leaders who are committed to bringing together educational goals and community development goals. Uh, I just, I'm abundantly aware I'm the only thing standing between you and Gary now, so I'll be very brief because I'd rather hear from him too. Uh, I want to just say two things. Uh, the first is that, and I suspect Gary will give you some rendition of this, I think it, it, it's a compliment to Augsburg uh, in that I think it takes a village to raise a professor of the year. Uh, there are so many people here uh, throughout the institution that shape a culture that is profoundly supportive of the kinds of things Gary has done. I'm gonna, my second point is I'll tell you how Gary has spent a significant role <laughs> and has had a significant role in creating that culture. But from President Frame and Provost Kimball, uh, Frankie Shackelford, and I know Diane Pikes with the Center for Teaching and Learning, and Lois Olson, and a bunch of all, folks all over, scores of faculty here who are interested in the same kind of issues. There's a, this is a place <laughs> where a professor of the year can emerge. Uh, I especially want to acknowledge the folks at the Center for Service Work and Learning and Mary True and Mary Benazuti who have worked so closely with Gary and these scores of faculty to make these community connections very powerful. You know, Jim Fournier and some other community-based partners here, which is a testimony to Augsburg's continued leadership in innovative teaching and learning strategies and connected teaching and learn learning strategies. So I first want to say congratulations to Augsburg. Uh, second thing I want to say is uh, Obviously, Gary has helped shape this culture over the last several years. And uh, I'm not going to say a lot about uh, kind of what he's done here at Augsburg. Obviously, I don't know that as well as some of you, but you all know that he's been a critical player in advancing various forms of experiential learning and certainly in the civic engagement and service learning realm. I want to tell just one quick story about how Gary has made an impact, well, two stories actually, at the state and national level. Uh, his work with the National Society for Experiential Education for years and years, much like his work with HECUA, really helped shape the dialogue about higher education and, and experience-based learning. And his leadership there in, in uh, making connections between NSEE and Campus Compact and various other organizations that have similar mission was very important at a time when this service learning civic engagement uh, movement was getting off the ground in the mid-80s. Uh, Gary, as you also know, at the national level, was a recipient of Campus Compact's highest faculty award, uh, uh, the, the Thomas Ehrlich Award for Excellence in Service Learning. Uh, Minnesota is actually the only state to have two recipients of that award, uh, and they're both connected to Riverside Avenue, John Wallace right across the street at University of Minnesota. And this relates to the second part of what I want to say, and that is that in the mid-80s, this idea of student civic engagement was primarily um, grounded in the co-curricular realm. And there were many of us that thought if civic engagement was really going to have a significant impact on how higher education does business and a significant impact on local communities, we were going to have to move service learning and civic engagement into the core of the institution, courses, curricula, etc. That was not a real popular idea in 1987, 88, 89. And when some young idealistic kid 20 years ago asked Gary and John if they would commit to convening the first gathering we know of <laughs> in the state to say, to bring faculty together, to say how can we advance service learning in terms of integration into courses and curricula, Gary didn't flinch. And I'll just tell you, from those humble beginnings, what did we have, Gary, a dozen people at that meeting? Uh, recently, you folks hosted, in the last couple of years, a service learning and sociology event that had 65 people that had Gary's leadership. We've done a series of 20 discipline-specific events for faculty around the state. The number of faculty that now integrate service learning in higher education in Minnesota is, is, is astounding compared to what it was then. Um, final thing I want to tell you is, um, Gary has been, for me, a tremendous mentor as well, and to many people in this field. Uh, never did he waver. I can name three people, and Gary's one of them. Uh, when, uh, you know, I didn't have much professional experience 20 years ago, he expressed every confidence that we could do what we set out to do and believed unequivocally 
in me and a few other folks uh, and the vision and the passion we had. And that kind of mentorship, that kind of belief, that kind of constant faith that good ideas will prevail, I think uh, Gary has brought to many settings. But I wanted to say thank you to Gary both for his uh, contribution in bringing together the original group, the constant support you've given to Campus Compact, and the constant support and encouragement and leadership you've had around the country. I don't have time to mention he's involved in so many other things that have been supportive nationally and in the state. Uh, you know what they are, Gary, and I just want to say a public thanks for this. Congratulations. Well, it's now my pleasure to, uh, to bring Gary Hesser up here and uh, formally present him the governor's proclamation in its colorful form, as opposed to the, one, uh, the black and white version I gave Frankie earlier. But one uh, statement that was not read yet out of here, which I think really typifies Gary, whereas the quality of life and scope of opportunity for many future citizens of Minnesota will be determined by the quality of teaching in the classroom at all levels. Therefore, I name this day Dr. Gary Hesser Day in Minnesota. Please welcome Gary Hesser to the podium. Ann Frame and I were talking. It, it is a little bit like attending one's rec or obituary, or, uh, but it's better to be here for it. Than, uh, almost exactly to this day, 28 years ago, uh, I picked up a notice from the American Sociological Association that had a job description. And I carried it to Nancy and I said, somebody wrote, a job description that I may be the only person in the world who fits it. And being a person at that time who very much needed a job with four children at home, I wrote to Augsburg College, which I'd never really heard of before. They wanted somebody who was interested in urban sociology and sociology of religion. Well, on April 1st, and it was April 1st, and Nancy and I again pinched ourselves to see if it was an April Fool's joke. I got a call from Bob Grahams inviting me to come here and teach and attempt to follow in the footsteps of Joel Torstensen. Uh, I've written elsewhere, and other times we can talk. Uh, my life has been kind of a strange version of when you come to the fork in the road. It's not always the romantic version like Robert Frost, and he took the road less traveled, it may be occasionally more like Yogi Berra's version, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> because many of my forks have been in response to no's and losses and disappointments, as well as opportunities. Let me, in this context of, of this room of people eating, use a metaphor of a banquet and tables to just make some acknowledgments. When I came here to visit, the conversation was so rich and so enjoyable. And on the plane back home, I said to myself literally, oh my gosh, did I really work hard enough? Because I sat and did a little chart, did I want to go become a they never offered the job, but a department chair at a Division I up-and-coming school out in Virginia, they would have blown me away and eaten me alive in about 28 minutes. But I really went home saying, I want that job. And what I went home with was a deep conviction that the table had been set. And I want to acknowledge that this faculty, 30 plus years ago, as was cited in the article this morning, uh, made a decision that experiential education was not something out there on the periphery, but it was core stuff. Dewey was right. And when I met this faculty, and in the early years, there are four people, and it's always risky to name four people, who set this table in rich and bountiful ways. And to use again the metaphor, then and for those early years, invited me to that table. They said it. 
And those four legs, one you will know immediately, is my mentor, my friend, Joel Torsenson, who with his partner, Fran, had founded not only HECUA, but the SUS program in Scandinavia. Uh, but to be asked to come and, and, and step into those shoes was not only exciting, but challenging, but to be then mentored and partnered and supported. So if you can vision one leg of that table, there's all kinds of things, HECUA, SUS, MUST, Crisis Colony, the Urban Studies Program, the Sociology Department, the Social Work Department, a paper called The Liberal Arts College in the City, which philosophically and epistemologically set the stage for what happened here. But as Mark has just said, you don't do this alone, it's a village. Miles Stenchel, who's sitting back there, is a second very important leg on that table. Miles, before I got here, had been deeply involved in helping to form and shape the political scientists in the state and internship programs. Uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated and Joe Bash and Joel Torsenson said, uh, I think there are things to be learned out here in the community, Miles Stenchel, without a miss, said, I run the summer school program, let's do it next summer. That kind of support and collegiality in urban studies and so many other things. There are two other people who really constituted legs, and that's Bob Clyde. Bob was one of those guys who carried the water, was always there, was a secretary to HECUA. When I gave up on getting a cooperative education grant, Bob kept writing and rewriting it until suddenly Gary had funds to run around and do those national things, as well as a colleague who was always there. A person who retired recently, Vern Bloom, who was an early formative person in the social work department. But before that, Vern created for this college what was called Conserving Human Resources, CHR, another one of those acronyms, must CHR. Vern also took this college and validated classes in the prison, classes at Travilla, things that no other college in this nation had the audacity to do and to do well. The entire prison education system in the state is due to Vern's pioneering work. Well, when you inherit a table with those firm legs and all the other people who ate at the table and celebrated, I'm not being unduly modest. You can't help but succeed to some degree. Well, that's one end of the bookend of this banquet table to which I've been feasting all these years. If you could go ahead to the present table that I am treated to feast at daily, my sociology colleagues. To walk up the steps each day and to look forward just to being with colleagues who have set a bar higher than anything one is able to attain oneself in their teaching, in their professional demeanor, in their commitment to students, keeps me pedaling faster. And I am deeply grateful for that kind of quality that I get to work in every day. The Center for Service Work and Learning, another leg on the table of the present table. All that set of colleagues who sometimes I've had a chance to hire them, they've taught me, they've worked with me, they've given legitimacy to what I do around the country. So when I talk, it's not just emptiness on my own failures and sometimes my successes, but a whole institution that has created a center like that and a staff of people like that to make things work and to take us into that future of cathedral building that was referred to earlier. The Center for Global Education. It was a privilege just to be a part of the early advisory committee, to share an office down the hall when it was being formed with a staff of one and a half to get to lead some programs in Central and South America, watch my daughter and members of my family prosper at that, and students come back transformed and changed. To have that core group keeping our eyes away in a bigger vision than even just our neighborhoods in the city uh, is an extraordinary commitment of this institution and of that set of colleagues. A new and amorphous but quite specific group that the fourth leg on this present table is our collaboration of the Augsburg Experience Engaging Minneapolis Collaboration Task Force of people 
who have been given the challenge and the gift of a new curriculum, which is embraced in some new and scary ways for a guy who still wonders how it'll affect the urban studies program, to take this freshman program called Engaging Minneapolis and a graduation requirement called the Augsburg Experience and truly make it the punctuation mark, the signature element, the gold mine that Joel Torsenson told us about years ago that the city and the world represents for learning. Well, those are two tables in the banquet hall. And there's another table that's a group of kind of insider outsiders. We've already referred to Hecua. I think Joel had barely met me at the plane and words Hecua must sust began to flow off of his tongue and my head began to swim. Hecua has been that base point for me off campus and on campus to educate me. I think the year that I became president of the Hecua board, Nadine Cruz, who was here recently to do a campus compact, handed me a book by David Kolb called Experiential Education. And she didn't say very subtly, you need to read this. She said, you need to read this. It's been the core of what I've done in so many ways, and Hecua has, has played that home base. Mark's already referred to the National Society for Experiential Education. One of those forks in the road, thanks to Bob Clyde and co-op travel money when Augsburg was about to declare financial exigency, I got to travel. And I walked into a meeting once where Nadine Cruz had said somebody died and we need a one-year term. Will you fill it on the board? They said a PhD, a tenured position from a faculty, that, from a college that supports professors doing this. Why don't you be an officer? I think they hardly knew my name, but it had to do with Augsburg, a commitment, an institution, a rarity at that point, as Marcus pointed out, in terms of the kind of commitment that this college had to support faculty who were interested in these things. Campus Compact. You've heard from Mark, Campus Compact at the state and national level has opened innumerable opportunities, given me honors, but perhaps most importantly, stimulated and challenged me and all of us to keep rethinking and rethinking and re-engaging in this community-based learning enterprise to which we're committed. Uh, there's a fourth leg on that table, and that's all the community partners that we've worked with at Augsburg. I can look around this room today and see some, like Jim and PPL and others, you kind of represent that, the charter schools, the neighborhood organizations, like my colleagues from the Seward Neighborhood Group, people who have had the audacity to say yes when we picked up the phone and said, can we send students to help, can we work? But they've also had the audacity to say no. No, that's what partnership is about. We can't do it this time, just like we sometimes have to say no to them. That's what collaboration and reciprocity is about. So that fourth leg on this table of people outside the campus has been our community partners uh, near and far. Two final tables. And I'm so glad to see some of you here because the other table is really filled with all the students. Because really fundamentally, that's what it's all about. Whether it's two folks who meet in the back room and get married and have three kids who meet in a class that I teach who babysit for my older kids when my youngest one is born. Those are stories. Somebody whose baby plays underneath the table in an urban planning class. It's really all about that. And so that table filled to capacity with students. And I'm so grateful that so many of you uh, are here today. And finally, one last table at the banquet. And like American Indian lore, there's other tables that we can't name whose voices need to be heard and who enter our lives and bring richness and fullness, we'll leave a few empty tables too. But of course, the last table is Nancy and my family. And you've heard from Robin. Electronics are an amazing thing. Last night, Robin and I are on the phone exchanging social security numbers and conversations about which job offers she needs and might pursue and all kinds of things, but the letter was a surprise. But those open houses at the house could never have happened if Nancy hadn't been there. The HECUA board meeting we will never forget after we just had dismissed one executive director and Nancy was sitting there 
one day after bringing our baby home from the hospital, well, we waited for the board to finish its business, which took forever. Well, that's just kind of the ultimate symbol of how many times Nancy has made it possible for me to be a genial host. Each of my kids in different ways has certainly played that role. And so my family is the eternal, always there, nourishing, never failing, frequently chiding, often questioning. And I am terribly gifted in that regard. Well, mostly I thank each of you also for being here today and helping me to celebrate a very special honor and occasion, a one that belongs to each and every one of you. Because as Mark and others have said, you don't do this, it's a, alone, it's a village. And each of you in separate ways have been a part of that, as well as all the host of witnesses that aren't able to be here and that we remember. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you all for coming, and uh, please uh, feel free to take some time to visit with Gary if you'd like, and, uh, and, and again, um, celebrate with him on this very special day. Thanks.